Horology, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the urban gentry. It's continuing mission to explore strange new watches, to seek out cool vintage pieces with pure class, to boldly go where no watch channel has gone before. Okay, hi guys, and welcome to the show. And today I'm finally going to be reviewing my darling little Fortis chronograph. This is the official um, Cosmonaut chronograph that I bought, I think it was just after I got back from Switzerland. So it was the end of October, November time last year. I bought this on the used market. This is the smaller second generation 38 millimeter size. As you guys know, I've reviewed uh, the current incarnation of this watch. The, uh, I guess you could say it's Descendant. Uh, this stunning beast of a watch. This is the current classic version of the uh, uh, official Cosmonaut chronograph. And then of course we have uh, the B-52, sorry, not B-52, I'm thinking of uh, planes, the B-42. <laughs> and this is the, the, the pinnacle of the official Cosmonaut chronograph line and is still being used to this day uh, in space. If you are un uninitiated with this incredible brand, uh, have a look back in the videos I did. I, I reviewed these two. I'll leave links down below. But I thought um, uh, to give a, a better context to this watch and why I chose this particular piece, the differences between this uh, older generation and the current models, I thought I'd do a comparative review. And of course, before I get into this, I've got to do a very quick wristwatch check. Uh, and today I'm wearing my little Fleming, the uh, Rolex Explorer on a British racing green NATO strap. Uh, and don't ask me where I picked this up. I think it, it might have been a gift, and I think it just works with the um, Explorer so well. So that's my wristwatch check. Right, now, before we discuss the watch itself, I, I think it's fair just to revisit uh, Fortis's incredible history. So I think to, to really give the watches we're looking at today a little bit more depth and to understand how their design came about, we really have to look at the history of this incredible company. Um, now, I had the pleasure of visiting them at their, their factory and I received this book as a gift, uh, which is one of my most treasured possessions now. The story, or the name at least, starts 2,000 years ago, as you see there. Um, the Fortis name comes from these oil lamps that were made uh, during the Roman Empire, the um, zenith of the Roman Empire. These were very rudimentary time, not time-telling devices, but they were oil lamps and they were designed to be a specific, um, to carry a specific amount of oil that would burn for exactly 12 hours for the evening and nighttime hours. So when this would um, burn out, it would be daylight. So in essence, a very rudimentary time-telling device. And on the bottom of these was uh, Fortis, the word Fortis, and this is what they were called. So that is where the name comes from. Now, uh, we'll see here we have the original, the main man. Uh, there's old Walter, or Volta, uh, who founded the company with the original building. This is actually behind the building we visited uh, which of course is in Gretchen in Switzerland. And there's the, the 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 big main building. Exactly the same. It was like walking into a museum. It was just incredible. I, I mean, I can't describe the feeling, and I, I really started to appreciate the brand more, especially looking at all their vintage models. And then we see the British inventor John Harwood and watchmaker, of course, um, who invented the first automatic. Uh, wristwatch and there I believe this is it so it was just a bumper fascinating all the same so that was uh, way back I, I believe it was released in um, 26 1926 then we have the Art Deco period and then we have the Fortissimo which was the first waterproof uh, wristwatch incredible absolutely incredible 
I love these old chronographs. I hope they um, they bring these back. But anyway, I, I guess we're, we're we're just drooling at the uh, these beautiful old timepieces. But we should fast forward a little bit. So the Fliegers and Pilot professional watches of the 80s, uh, and they and there you can see very clearly Flieger inspired, very clean designs. This is this is typical of Fortis. Um, and you can even see, let's just bring back my watch there. You can even see a slight resemblance that, you, that the groundwork for the design is already starting to be, to take shape. The cosmonaut chronographs were, um, their DNA, as you can see, is aviation pieces. So Fortis made um, special chronographs and pilot watches for all sorts of international elite air forces. So we have the, the NATO Tigers there, a reconnaissance squadron of the German army. We have Portuguese Air Force, Russian Knights here down in the corner there. Uh, this I believe is the Hungarian, the Papa Air Bear, so there's a Hungarian Air Force, um, NATO again. Rampages there, which are based in um, uh, Virginia, which is part of the U.S. Navy, it's very very cool indeed. Uh, who else? Well, there's there's tons of them. Uh, Austrian Air Force here. This has really laid the groundwork for for the um, for the watches that we are looking at today. And then of course this evolved into watches. Oh, we have the world's first automatic chronograph with alarm. I believe there is even a version for the cosmonaut chronograph. So very cool complication. And then finally, the space going era, space, there you go, the space going era. Now, as I said, the Spacematic, which I also reviewed, uh, was used during testing uh, by the US astronauts. This was way, way back in the 60s. So the very first chronographs here we see in the mid 80s, that led to this very first series, uh, which were then selected officially by the Russian Federal Space agency and this is pretty much um, where my watch comes in you can access this online there's a report of the Fortis chronographs uh, and how they held up under tests and especially space conditions so these were all performed at the Yuri Gagarin uh, cosmonaut training center in Star City near Moscow they underwent uh, the most rigorous endurance tests and these tests were, were conducted by technical specialists uh, that are officially recognized at the training center and have long-standing experience um, especially when it comes to the reliability and successful preparation of manned space flights. So over the uh, testing period, and the, this um, this is how they were selected to become the, uh, the, the the official chronographs. These tests took about six months. Fortis chronographs were exposed to various simulated space conditions to mimic the uh, the Russian space agency orbiting Earth. These were conducted in special pressure chambers and also um, a, a hydro laboratory uh, which simulate weightlessness. Now the chronographs proved their reliability inside and outside the space station on the wrists of countless, countless uh, cosmonauts. The watchers spent 11 hours in an open space vacuum conditions and extreme temperature fluctuations of between minus 200 degrees to plus 100 degrees centigrade, which is um, caused by work both uh, in Earth's shadow and under direct solar uh, irradiation. So the chronographs withstood all of that, and that's a massive, massive achievement. People don't really uh, appreciate what, what goes into this. So the, uh, the chronographs were used in all kinds of different uh, scenarios, including actually the daily fitness training of the um, astronauts and cosmonauts. And due to the orbiting velocity of about 20 thousand kilometers an hour this the the, uh, the space station team experienced sunrise and sunset 12 times in 24 hours 
the wristwatch in this situation is is the most important time orientation in in relation to Earth time. So keeping time up there is incredibly important. And by virtue of the often diffuse lighting conditions on board the orbital station, the chronograph indicator hands in neon orange, uh, legibility is of course incredibly important. And when I was in the watch factory, I got to see one of these in the display cabinet. I think I have some footage of it. I'll try and include it. Immediately drawn to it because of its smaller size. I just loved its very no-nonsense kind of rugged appeal. It just, it really, that, I, that was the fortress I wanted. So when I got back to the United States, back to New York, lo and behold, I found one for sale in Austria. And we, here we are, ha pictures uh, of astronauts actually wearing them in space and then begins this incredible dynasty i mean a, a a an age of from i think they were officially chosen in 1994 and then starts this amazing legacy of space missions and i think this highlights a really important point that from all the watches that have gone into space from the Amiga Speedmaster, from the G-Shocks, to the Bulovas, to, uh, what else is, um, from the Pogue, for, uh, Seikos, etc, etc. Fortis, without a doubt, as you can see, has spent the highest amount of time in space being worn by astronauts and cosmonauts than any other watch brand. Collectively, I mean, just the other day I saw a fantastic uh, photograph of Mikhail Kornienko, uh, who wore the actual, this particular watch, not on this strap, but as you'll see in the uh, picture, he wore this watch, the um, Cosmonaut Chronograph Classic. I believe it was a PM, so it was the black dial, not the white dial. During the 2015 uh, year-long mission uh, on the International Space Station. So just imagine that watch was up there for, f <laughs> for a year. I mean, that's staggering. I, 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 I wonder if collectively the, um, the Speedmasters could rack up that kind of time, even, even on just... Oh, there he is. There he is. So very, very cool. And, and, you know, the proof is in the pudding. So I just thought I'd give a little bit of background. I mean, it never ends. This is the kind of history. This is the legacy. This is the, the heritage that most companies would die for you know it's just very very special so let's have a look at the watches themselves so these are the two in question this is the modern incarnation and then we have um i guess you could say it's it's father or yeah because this because its great grandfather was the first one which was uh, lamagna based it was uh, the the five one Zero zero, which of course is one of the most highly respected automatic uh, chronograph movements. This has the Valjoux 7750, as does its modern um, descendant, and as you can see on the display back, and that is one of the main differences. Apart from the um, upgrade in size, this now has a display back with a custom rotor. So let's discuss size a little bit first. So the diameter is 38 millimeters. We have a thickness of 13.5 lug to lug it's uh, just a smidgen under 47 and then a really nice lug width of 20 millimeters which is perfect because i can put all my favorite straps on it and that's in comparison to the modern equivalent which is 42 millimeters in diameter got a height of just a, a flick under 15 lug to lug is 50 millimeters and usually the lug width is 20 again so a very contemporary scale i think you know that's that's perfectly understandable this newer case there's a lot more polishing uh, they've added a ceramic bezel instead of the fixed steel bezel you can still get a steel fixed bezel 
if you want. The ceramic obviously being tougher and scratch resistant. One of the biggest differences that I immediately noticed was the screw down pushers have now, they've done away with that. This has screw down pushers, the previous version. They both have a water resistance of 100 meters. I like the screw down pushers and of course the screw down crown. I find it endearing. I love the way it's flush when you totally screwed out. The advantage is you can actually lock it into position if you don't want to muck up timing. However, you know, it is a bit of annoyance if you're using it all the time. So they've, they've done away with that with the new one. Um, and I get that. I get that. Crown has also been greatly increased. It's definitely larger in proportion to its predecessor. The tachymeter bezel also has been simplified. There are less little steps. They've also managed to keep the water resistance to 100 meters without a screw down crown, which is a really admirable thing. And more incredibly on the uh, B42, this is 200 meters water resistant with no screw down pushes and no screw down crown. A remarkable achievement, but this really is the business. I mean, th this is probably one of the, the, the best made chronographs in its price range. I've reviewed it to death. It's, it's, it's not, it's almost over engineered. It's just so incredible this watch, but um, yeah. So what else has changed? Well, they've, they've carefully nuanced the dial design slightly. As you can see, the sub dials now are, are, are sunken in and they have that beautiful concentric circle pattern. The hands, they are now polished steel. They've changed the uh, color orange and added an arrow tip so that it does have loom now. So that's a definite improvement. There's more detail on the actual dial itself. The minute track is sunken on the newer one. While very, very subtle, it does give it a slightly more nuanced uh, kind of elegance about it. Also the way that the, the light plays with the subdials with the, that kind of almost sunburst effect certainly is a little bit more stylish. Also the date window this time is framed with a crisp white outline. I actually prefer the, the simplicity of, of my dial. Um, I just feel it's a little bit more truer to its roots. Although yeah, it's, it's obviously simpler. The lugs are quite substantial, especially from a profile and they certainly have been beefed up in the newer version and a little bit more streamlined. Also, there's a greater detail in the, um, the polishing. The polishing is done incredibly well. It's lost a little bit of that tooltastic aesthetic to the original. So we have the standard Valjoux 7750 layout with the day date complication. The movement performs exactly the same. You know, we're talking a 25 joule movement, 28,800 vibrations an hour with a 48 hour power reserve. The Valjoux, I, I adore. It's been going since 1973. Any competent uh, watchmaker can fix it. They're robust, reliable. My one, incredibly, being from 2002. So this is, so the new uh, Fortis Classic, it was released in 2015. Uh, mine, despite being <laughs> from 2002, still operates at about plus, I think it's about plus three, which is very, very impressive. It is not the highest grade level, although the new one now has some decoration. We do get blued screw there and of course a display back. I personally think it's a little bit unnecessary, um, but I understand this is more of a smarter affair. I actually really appreciate the uh, logo on the back. I just, I think it's cool. I just think it's cool. There's no need really to have, it's, it's, it's kind of um, uh, superfluous uh, in a tool watch, but I understand this is, this is for a different market really. Whereas this was a tool intended for a purpose. Now mine, I bought used, as I, as I said, so there, it, there is, you know, scuffs and marks, but I kind of like that. I like the fact that it's a little bit beaten up. You see, there's, there's scratches on it and, and a few marks, but the, the printing on the fixed bezel is still in good condition. Sometimes the black ink in the engraving comes out. As we pull the crown out all the way, you see it is hackable. If we push it back in, we have manual wind, which is standard for 7750. And if I change the date, we do have quick set. Um, 
And if I turn it the other way, we change the day of the week. If I start the chronograph, um, you can see that the corresponding orange uh, matches the chronograph function. So uh, the Valjou, famously, the 7750 is a 12 hour uh, chronograph with 30 minutes at the top and then the 12 hours at the bottom. There's a very precise track running around the outside. I love how the seconds hands are blacked out towards the center where you have a matte black dial, whereas the newer one now has this glossy uh, dial. Also, the, the they've kept the Arabic numerals and Flieger-esque arrow and markers at the um, uh, three, six, and nine. It gives it almost a kind of crosshead look to it. Also improves balance. I love the the layout of this. I think the fact that none of the numerals are cut off; they're spaced apart perfectly. Numerals this time are applied, although. Um, so subtly, you, you hardly even notice it. And they have uh, shifted some of the text almost in a kind of Daytona style over that uh, subdial at the six. So we have classic cosmonaut. The new version now has a domed sapphire. Both watches have sapphire glass with anti-reflective coating. This is probably one of the biggest negatives of this buying used one. You can see as I move it, the uh, some of the anti-reflective coating is starting to, to wear. It still works incredibly well, but uh, I might have to have the, um, the coating or, or, or the the sapphire replaced again i don't really mind too much because i like the fact it's a little bit worn when i was buying this what i was looking for was the loom to be nice and responsive and the orange not to have faded i've seen many many especially the older ones even though the lamania based are more collectible pretty much anything with the 5100 lamania is collectible but the problem is the dials are faded i love that orange especially on on um, the fortis watches i just find them playful yet you know they're, they're not there just to look cool they they actually serve a purpose they're there to be instantly legible and correspond the chronograph function so you can get a good reading at a quick glance something i didn't like about some of the early lamani ones is they had tritium loom which was faded this loom still works uh, pretty well um, and as you guys know I, I like to wear watches at night time especially when I'm sleeping and checking the, the time in the middle of the night which is something I do I don't know why I just wake up and I have to know the time so this still functions perfectly well so I'm glad it's the Super Luminova. so the case on mine is satinized there is no high polished surfaces whatsoever uh, even though the, the pushes do look a little bit uh, I guess polished it's just because they have been used and over time it's become slightly polished there but again you know I, I've matched it with my lucky Zulu and I just think it works perfectly so let's pop it on the wrist and see how it wears so as you can see on my tiny little wrist it wears perfectly I love the 38 millimeter size the lug width um, yeah it's a tall one but you know that's the main Ah, the main issue with the 7750, I can't really complain about that. Um, but actually, I like its presence. It has a very reassuring presence on the wrist. It's lovable for what it is, which is, you know, um, ultimately uh, something designed for a purpose. And it gives off that impression um, beautifully. The weight is a 96 grams. It did come, I have to uh, point out, on a brushed bracelet, if you remember the unboxing. Um, interestingly enough, if I just undo the fold over, the links do have screwed links, even back in 2002. I'm not going to name any names, but there's several luxury companies that um, at that time didn't even bother, still were using pins. What's really cool, it has a very rudimentary, uh, it's not a diver's extension, I guess you could say it's a flight suit extension. So, you know... <laughs> I love the fact they've even included that. We have micro extensions, um, and I love how they've included the Fortis crown on the fold over. The links are solid. Uh, I don't have them on me right now. I've put, stored them away, and to be honest, I can't find them. Um, but yeah, a very solid bracelet. It tapers nicely. Uh, but I, as you guys know, I'm 
I love my uh, my straps. And I I got to be honest, it hardly ever leaves this strap because obviously the my lucky Zulu has the uh, brushed hardware. I'll throw in a shot so you can see how it compares with my six point two five inch wrist. Uh, with the uh, the larger contemporary uh, offering or, or Cosmonaut Classic. That one is about 102 grams. I don't know how much it is on the bracelet because um, Fultis have lent me the strap version. So let's discuss its positives and negatives. So I've got to say, I love, I adore Fultis. I think it's uh, pretty obvious. It's certainly uh, more of a connoisseur's watch brand it's especially if you're into aviation it's probably going to be on your radar it's not that well known and unfortunately Fortis these days they are having um, financial difficulties I'm sure they will pull through I mean they've survived the courts crisis they've survived much worse you know d depressions at the end of the day they are still at the current moment of filming this they are still independent incredible incredible heritage that as I said many brands would murder for you, you can pick this up for under 2000 from about 1000 to, to 2000 it depends where you're buying i think is amazing value for money the quality is there there's an incredible amount of qc and i saw it firsthand and, and attention to detail they make beautifully designed watches i've never had any issues with the fortis watch of all the fortis watches i reviewed and you know unfortunately I'm i have to return these to um, after this video is done. And I've got to say a massive thank you uh, to, to the wonderful people at uh, Fortis for lending me. And I apologize it's taken me so long to make this video, but um, the fact that they are embracing um, social media and you know that they, they are forward thinking. And I think you get your money's worth. You get a brand you can be proud of. And I, I think that's really, really important. I love this watch to such an extent that it's it's kept me from buying a Speedmaster again. You know, I am at the moment considering a Speedmaster. I'm, I'm gonna buy one because I want one in the collection. And I look forward to dueling them together with uh, or against this or other, because I think it will be a really interesting video. Um, this is basically the non-luxury but no-nonsense, more affordable connoisseur's choice. And I respect that. I love it. Ultimately, the Fortis Cosmonaut Chronograph is the best alternative to an Amiga Speedmaster. While the Amiga Speedmaster could be accused of, of being something of a cliche, and you know every other watch collection seems to have one, or often the first luxury watch for a lot of people, and it's seen as that kind of timepiece that, yeah, you want to have some kudos, you want to um, be respected and, and have an iconic uh, space-going watch. Well, I, I would strongly consider the Fortis. I feel it's a little bit more unique. Uh, it has a personality of its own. It's unpretentious in the fact that it hasn't got a million and one uh, special editions that has in some ways oversaturated the market. Uh, there is a really nice uh, array of complications. There are GMT models, there are versions with alarms even, uh, a few special editions with various dials and particularly limited editions to celebrate uh, individual space missions. And these are very collectible in their own right. I also love the fact that you don't have to worry about servicing. Uh, I know the Valjoux 7750 very, very well. I love how it behaves. Some people might not like the being able to actually feel the rotor turn and you can hear it actually winding the watch. I like it. Um, and it's something that I think should be mentioned that uh, in a previous video when I first um, got the watch, there was a discussion in the comments whether an automatic watch uh, functions better in space or even if it's necessary in space or even if it functions at all. And Fortis actually replied, they left a comment saying that uh, automatic watches do wind even better in space. Now I'm not going to get into all the physics of it because to be honest uh, it's beyond my limited uh, intellect but um, yeah science is not my forte. But, however, and you feel it, it winds certainly much easier in comparison to some of my other 7750s. It's a watch for a task. It's um, There's an honesty of about it and I really respect that. And let's not forget Value-wise, it's more affordable than the Speedmaster. So let's talk a little bit about negatives. Well, I think the biggest negative is obviously that they don't make um, 
these uh, 38 millimeter sized versions anymore. I also would have liked drilled lug holes. It's not the biggest strap monster in the world. This certainly is much more versatile when it comes to, uh, because it is a tiny bit more dressier with the, with the polished uh, surfaces and it's quite glossy um, bezel in particular, the, the ceramic bezel. It is a little bit more elegant. I feel it could suit a wider variety of attire. Uh, when I wear my Cosmonaut Chronograph, um, especially if I dress casual, casual smart, with a jacket or something, it just doesn't go. It's too tooltastic, shall we say. Another negative is obviously it's not going to be as collectible as the, uh, the previous or first generation with the more prestigious Le Mania. I bought this and I'm going to be, forgive me, I'm going to be a little bit vulgar and talk about money. This was around about $1,000. I couldn't get it with the box and papers, which I, I am a little bit sorry about because if you've ever seen the, the case that they come with, they're really, really cool. You get a little spring bar tool and a um, little booklet with the, with the uh, Cosmonaut on it, and it's just really, really cool. However, if you, know, you haven't got a smallerish size, their current version, I think, is, is absolutely fantastic. I love it. I... I I love its clean, crisp design. It's it's certainly value for money. So anyway, guys, I'm going to leave it there. Please don't forget to add your thoughts, queries, opinions, comments down below. Uh, thank you very, very much for watching. Please don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it and found it useful. And as always, guys, I will catch you in the next one. Okay, ciao.